All right. Uh, okay, and, and I have I your should, blue. Shall I take the share screen? Yep. All right. All right, then. Uh, I said I would talk about mathematical notations, but um, uh, slanted in the direction of knot theory. Um, and so I shall. Um, uh, I, I guess I want to start just with the knot diagrams themselves. So what should we call these notes, notations? So the knot diagrams is an old tradition that we've used for a long time, but it turned out to have properties that in the 1980s particularly turned out to have properties that had not been suspected before. Um, it's a kind of remarkable simple notation, which is derived from the way you draw things uh, using way you sketch things using an undercrossing line to indicate that something is farther away um, and thereby giving a sense of perspective. And we've learned to decipher such things since we were children. So the knot diagrams uh, are uh, often thought of just as pictures, but of course, from a mathematical point of view, they're also um, describable in an abstract way as uh, as uh, four valent graphs that are planar and and then endowed with some extra structure that corresponds to the crossings and and then uh, I'm not sure at what point the uh, checkerboard graph of a knot uh, was invented um, but it was used by um, by people like Reitermeister, I think, um, and Alexander and Briggs, where you uh, you two color the plane graph that's involved and get a checkerboard coloring. So that's a two coloring theorem, a two coloring theorem um, of a very simple kind, and namely that if I if I draw any such graph in the plane, then I can color it in two colors. And, um, and I like this uh, fact, which is certainly more than a notational fact, right? Uh, it's, uh, um, it's interesting to prove it when you're teaching because uh, there are a lot of different ways to prove it. And it, um, it really is, uh, uh, an inst uh, a way of, uh, of generalizing or just simply deduced from the Jordan curve theorem. The Jordan curve theorem, of course, says that you can checkerboard color a simple closed curve by coloring the inside black and the outside white. And uh, if you want, you can... Um, you can think of uh, of the way in which you you assign the colors in the Jordan curve theorem by taking a point and uh, and taking a, a array which goes from that point into the outside region that is transverse to the curve, and then counting the parity of the number of points at which it crosses the curve. In this case, one, two, three, and odd parity is going to be inside and even parity is going to be outside. And the same rule will color uh, the knot diagram since you can choose uh, a uh, line which goes transverse to the knot and goes from inside to outside. But, but certain things become mysterious after that that I thought I would mention at the beginning of this. Um, we know the Reitermeister moves. And they, uh, and they are also 
a, a triumph of this diagrammatic or graph theoretic approach to thinking about knots, since after all, uh, it follows from uh, from Alexander and Briggs and Reitermeister that uh, if you if you adopt the three moves as general moves that can be applied to these kinds of graphs, then that generates uh, the ambient isotopy equivalents of knots in three-dimensional space by taking projections of them to the plane and taking the associated knot diagram and then two knots in three-dimensional space that are embedded are uh, ambient isotopic if and only if their projection diagrams are equivalent by a sequence of Reitermeister moves and uh, homeomorphisms of the plane. Uh, what happens when you translate the Reitermeister moves into the checkerboard structure? And I meant to say that, of course, people went one step further here and formed the checkerboard graph. By which I mean that you associate a vertex in the checkerboard graph to each shaded region in the diagram and you associate an edge in the checkerboard graph to each crossing, which is incident to two of the shaded regions. So that you end up with a plane graph whose vertices have various degrees depending on the number of crossings on the, bound, on the boundary of a given shaded region in the knot diagram. And if you want to be able to reconstruct the knot, you can take some uh, simple convention, like this is a standard convention that we use, right? That you, if you have a crossing through which the edge goes and it is in this relation to the edge, then this is called plus. It has nothing to do with orienting the diagram. It has to do with the relationship of the edge in the graph to the, uh, to the crossing in the knot diagram. And, Conversely, this one is minus. So then this would all be pluses, and that's a trefoil knot, recognizable as a trefoil knot if you're used to that coding. Uh, but uh, what happens to the Reitermeister moves? Uh, that's where I think this, this, uh, this sliding of notations or formulations begins to become a bit mysterious. What happens to the Reitermeister moves when you do this? Let's translate them. So let's take the first one. No, excuse me, I wanted to go back to black. Take the first Reitermeister move and think about how it could be shaded. So it might be shaded like that. Or it might be shaded like this, depends on where it is in a diagram. So there are going to be two cases. And, and then what will happen to the corresponding graph? Well, in one case, there's a vertex here which leads off to some other things. And I'll put a little triangle to mean leads off to some other things. And then there's an edge, which is here. And uh, this one happens to be plus. And over here, there's a vertex in that region leading off to other things. And then there's an edge in the graph. And by definition, if it's a self-crossing of a region, then it's a loop in the graph. Like that. And uh, this one happens to be negative by our definition. But you see, in both cases, they will be uh, removed. Uh, in this case, this will be removed. And you'll just have that, that leading off in some direction. And there'll be shading here. And in this case, there'll be shading on the other side. And this will be removed. So the rule um, for the first Reitermeister move is the removal of a pendant loop or a pendant edge. All right.
And in the case of the second Reitermeister move, where I seem to have switched colors, all right. Um, in the case of the second Reitermeister move, again, there are two cases. And one case looks like this. And the other case looks like this. And in the graph, leading off elsewhere, and two edges in parallel, one's plus and the other is minus. Here, leading off elsewhere and leading off elsewhere, and two edges in series, and one is minus and the other is plus. And what happens to them afterwards? Uh, let's just write, draw the graph that would happen afterwards. You pull them apart and you end up uh, with no uh, connections. And so they, they break to, to uh, a plus and a minus in series breaks into nothing. And here uh, they collapse because when you pull this apart, this all becomes one region, and the one region has one vertex, and so the two vertices become one. So in this case, a uh, parallel can question? Was there a question? The parallel edges um, become a deletion, and the series edges become a contraction. Um, but um, it may have occurred to someone else. I don't know. I've never, I haven't seen it, but it occurred to Jay Goldman and myself a while back that uh, this was remarkably similar to things that happen in electrical theory. And in fact, it's a correct formula that this corresponds to this in electrical theory and that this corresponds to that in electrical theory where in electrical theory, um, the value along the edge, let's call it A, can be taken to be conductance. Conductance is equal to the reciprocal of resistance if you're used to thinking in terms of resistance. And if you think of conductance as the amount, the size of the pipe and the amount of water that can flow through it, uh, then when you put two things in parallel to one another, you obviously increase the conductance and in fact you add it. Negative conductance means, um, means uh, amplification. Um, it, and, um, and so uh, is the opposite of the restriction of the other. Um, so when, so the, in other words, you were doing a formal generalization of pipes, which are only various positive amounts of conductance or positive amounts of resistance. So the rules in electrical theory are that if you have two conductances in parallel, then this is equivalent to a single conductance that is the sum of them. And in this case, of course, the sum of the plus and the minus is zero. And so zero conductance, which means the open circuit or the break. And, um, and, and the uh, corresponding result for series, which is the one that you may be thinking of is a peculiar formula. This is one divided by one over A plus one over B, um, which is sometimes better said as AB over A plus B. Um, and that's the formula for concatenated uh, series of conductances. And what is happening here? Well, uh, you have one divided by one over one plus one over minus one, which is equal to one over zero, which is equal to formal infinity. And uh, that's what the, uh, what the contraction is. It's infinitely conductive. 
no resistance. One over infinity is zero. Zero resistance, infinite conductance. And so the Reitermeister rules for the second Reitermeister move correspond to the electrical rules. And what about the third Reitermeister move? Well, here it's quite natural for me to just choose one of the shadings because the other kind of shading will occur when I do the move. Here I shaded this and I do the move and then the inherited shading looks like this, doesn't it? All right. And if we form the graph, then we have a star and a triangle. And let's see what the signs are. So we go in the graph, uh, in the graph picture, we go between a star and a triangle. And uh, we have a plus here, and we have a minus there, and we have a minus there. And over on the triangle, I have a plus here, and I have a minus there, and I have a minus here. Uh, let's, uh, let's actually just draw those separately so we can look at them. Uh, I, and it would go between triangle and star if I looked at the other shading. That's why I don't really need to look at two. The two cases are uh, dual to one another. Very well. So there's a simple rule. Um, if you were to superimpose the triangle and the star, then you could say that the edge of the triangle that goes between the two vertices that have nothing to do with the third edge is the dual edge. So the dual edge gets the opposite sign, plus to minus, minus to plus. And that's the rule which lets you change star triangles, stars to triangles, and triangles to star. And this is a special case. Of the star triangle. Lou, I think you should have two pluses and one minus on the triangle. Yeah, I should. Um, this plus should be a minus. This minus should be a plus. And this minus should be a plus. And uh, let's go back and look and yeah. see what happens. Yeah, that's a plus, not a minus. Thank you. OK, so uh, not only does that correct it, but it uh, affirms the rule I was uh, jumping to. OK, everybody okay. clear? Yeah, I don't expect you to do it here now, but uh, I'm other, sorry. There are other configurations of pluses and minuses that you're leaving as exercise. Is that correct? Uh, I, I didn't understand your question, Scott. Um, you so there are uh, maybe six different right of my. Oh uh, well, yeah. I, I'm not going to do all the cases. You can check the other cases. Okay, fine. Yeah. But you will find that in general, there will be two signs in one and one sign of the other kind. That's what I wanted to know. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, the special case of the star triangle relation in electricity. Uh, oh, I didn't think to 
uh, memorize that. Let me see. I, I'm sure I have it jotted down in something nearby. Just a second. There it is. Uh, is it? Okay, uh, I might as well show you the actual electrical relation because it, indeed it is an electrical relation and that means that if you wanted to, um, from the point of view of the graphs, you can compute the conductivity between two points and it will be a topological invariant. But I think that's a bit mysterious. We, we got the Reinemeister moves by um, projecting uh, just simply projecting from the movement of the knot around in three space. Um, but by the time we projected it down into the plane and translated it into these graphs, and the translation can be used. You can start with a signed graph and get the knot diagram back by doing the inverse of what we did to get it. Um, then you have uh, fallen into a set of moves which are corresponding to electricity. So. Let's explore this a little bit. Now, the first thing I wanted to do, as I said, was show you the electrical formula. So what's the electrical formula? you're going to have a, a triangle somewhere in your situation and a conductance A and a conductance B and a conductance C. And then afterwards, after you're going to have a star. And, uh, and let's call this C prime, the dual edge, and A prime and B prime. Uh, and uh, then if you would let D be equal to AB plus AC plus BC, then X prime is equal to D over X. This is the electrical transformation. Uh, and we could do a little exercise with that and see that it seems to be correct. Uh, suppose for example, that you decided that you were going to measure from here to here. You wanted to find out the conductance from there to there, right? So on the left-hand side, the conductance that you would measure would be the conductance of a circuit that is a parallel of a series. So the A and the B together can be replaced by AB divided by A plus B, and then you add on to that the C, and that is the conductance between these two points, which is equal to AB plus AC plus BC divided by A plus B. And if you take uh, L, uh, if you take D uh, divided by L, no, I'm sorry, I'd better follow my prescription or I will get things in the wrong order here. So, um, so now we're, we're over here now and we want the conductance between A prime and B prime, which is a series connection of A prime and B prime. And, um, and, and C doesn't come, C prime doesn't come into the mix at all. So what I will have on the right hand side will be equal to A prime times B prime divided by uh, A prime plus B prime, but better written as one divided by one over A prime plus one over B prime so that I can use my rule. And if I use my rule, then it, um, then it is going to be equal to one divided by uh, one over. So that's going to be A over D plus B over D, and that's going to be equal to multiplying top and bottom by D, D divided by A plus B, and as you see, those are equal.
So, uh, and uh, uh, with the exercise in front of you, you can begin to see how this was uh, figured out. Uh, now, all I'm doing here is showing you that it's going to work if you just measure conductances along the triangle, but then uh, a more intensive look at what happens in the conductance of the electrical network shows that that replacement will change, will leave the conductance of the entire network between any two points in it um, invariant if you use this substitution. So um, this was discovered, this is the star triangle relation in electricity. And it was discovered by Star, a man named Star in 1890. Um, of course, it's based on Kirchhoff's laws, but um, uh, I think that's all also mysterious, but we aren't probably going to be able to explain that. Uh, so it is therefore true that if I were interested in um, finding out something uh, about some knot, uh, and I wanted to use this point of view, uh, I could checkerboard color the knot, and then I could find the conductance between two points, say between these two points. And what would that be? Well, uh, that would be an invariant of the knot as long as I didn't move it over those two points. So in fact, you see that what I, what I can get uh, is a generalization of invariance of tangles. If those two points happen to abut to the same region, then, uh, then the graph that I am looking at is a graph that is associated with a tangle. Or in other words, I could start with some tangle, uh, checkerboard shaded, and then take the conductance between the top of the tangle and the bottom of the tangle, work out that conductance of that, uh, that bit of graph, and uh, and find an invariant of the tangle. And what do you think that turns out to be? It turns out the invariant of the tangle uh, up to, I'll write corresponds to, because there might be a factor there in, in going from one calculation to the other, but the invariant of the tangle corresponds to the Conway fraction of the tank. And so that, uh, that's a, a, a notational transformation, which I think is very interesting. And, and in, although historically, um, the, we didn't notice this correspondence until later, the star triangle relation actually is something that physicists were well aware of and is part of the lore of the Yang-Baxter equation, which can be thought of in certain forms as a kind of generalization of the star triangle relation in electricity. So, so, this, uh, so the Reinemeister moves themselves by means of combinatorial translation are related to um, graph theory and and to electrical theory and and you can go back and forth in some uh, that i know about elementary ways between electrical theory and um and 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 uh the and the topology for let me give you an example Uh, if networks that have uh, networks that can be suppose you have a network in the plane reducible by um, series. And parallel transformations, Ser series and series and parallel, and star triangle. 
reducible in the sense of computing it, right? Uh, consider networks like that. For example, maybe I wish to uh, figure out the resistance of this little network here. I want the resistance from here to here. Well, if I perform uh, a star triangle relation on it, then I can replace this triangle by a star. Uh -uh. Not doing well. That's right. That's right. Yes. And we end up here. And then this is series and parallel. So by and then uh, so now you see I can I can continue my calculation and I can calculate this by using series and and um, um, and parallel and be done. Right. What does this correspond to topologically? It corresponds to being able to reduce the network to something simple by means of a uh, second Reinemeister move and third Reinemeister move. So if I were to take um, something which um, is, um, um, is made from a knot diagram, then you can conclude that it will reduce because reducing doesn't depend on whether uh, whether these things are Reitermeister moves or not. You will still have star triangle relations. So you're just talking about the underlying graph being able to be manipulated through um, through Reitermeister two and Reitermeister three. It means, for example, that if I just choose an arbitrary um, knot diagram like this. And I were to convert it into a tangle like that, let's say, and um, and then wonder how what it would be like to compute the network. Well, the answer is that there's no problem in computing the corresponding network. It will be reducible by star triangle relations and series and parallel relations. Uh, you might think we you would have some uh, some more diabolical network, but it won't happen because this can be reduced by uh, uh, Reitermeister moves until it's very simple. So you can get theorems that go back and forth because of what you know from the knot theory about reducing knot diagrams. And people use this. Um, but uh, let me uh, jump to something else that was mysterious. Uh, uh, one thing that was mysterious was the star triangle formula and the and that duality that you saw and the series parallel relation but how does that look to us when we're thinking about tangle fractions because we have something similar happening in tangle fractions here is a tangle and here is another tangle and here is their sum of tangle s and t and here's their sum. And of course, you understand now that that corresponds exactly to um, to a series relation. So, for example, if I'm taking the sum of one and two, which is very interesting, um, and um, and I took the network like this, uh, why then uh, I have a Oh, I chose the wrong one. <laughs> uh, um, well, that's the other operation. If I, if I took the sum in this form, then, um, and took this uh, version, then I would be uh, getting the series relation. But after all, what is the rule that I was just telling you about? I'm going to, uh, I can just dualize it and then everything will be fine. So I wish to compute conductance from here to here. And now in order to do that, I need the other coloring. So let's use the other coloring. And then you see that when I use the other coloring, uh, then I will have the 
additivity. I'll just put a little wiggly line in here for the other one. I'm getting the additivity of the conductance for tangle T and the additivity for tangle S. So, so this, uh, this corresponds to S plus T. But you also <coughs> see that if I were to put the tangles on top of one another like this, And um, let's do an example so it's real. Uh, maybe I have this tangle, and maybe I have um, this tangle. Um, and I'm going to put one tangle on top of the other, like that. Uh, and I want to find the conductivity from here to here, uh, then I'm going to be looking at a series connection starting from here, um, ending in here, whatever happens here, and then starting from here and ending in here, and whatever happens here. And I'll be looking at it in series. And we know that the formula in series is the reciprocal of the sum of the reciprocals. And how does this look in the notation of the tangle theory? That's what's amusing. So we know that it should correspond that way, but uh, but how does it actually happen in the tangle theory? Well, there is an inverse. There is an inverse in the tangle theory. And the inverse is the following, that you, um, there are two inverses. There is the negative. If you have if you, I just remind you now of how it works in the tangle theory. You have the mirror image of the tangle, and the mirror image of the tangle is minus, I'm just going to be writing the value of it, is minus the value of the tangle, right? That's by definition. So, for example, minus 3 is minus 3, which is equal to the mirror image, like that. And when you add, when you add, when you when you add a minus three to a three, it cancels, right? So that's the negative. But the other inverse, the inverse one over a tangle, that's given by turning the tangle by ninety degrees and taking its mirror image. That's the Conway rule, and, and that works just fine. For example, if I wish to take 1 over 2, then that's equal to turn it by 90 degrees and take its mirror image, and you have this. I just, you'll note that I did take its mirror image before turning it, and that's 1 half. And all that works out. So we know what we mean by 1 over t, and we know what we mean by, uh, by the other. And so, and so therefore, given that this is plus, we can see what we would get from this. Or more easily, for the sake of, of the diagrammatic calculation, what does it look like to take 1 over 1 over s? plus 1 over t. Well, how do I do this 1 over in a reasonable way? Well, one thing is this, that I could say that minus 1 over t is equal to just turn it. And then in order to turn it, I can do it uh, topologically like that. So if you, if you keep on with that, it turns it by 90 degrees. Fine. So minus 1 over t is the result of taking the left upper line and pulling it down and the right lower line and pulling it up. And now I need another board in order to do the duality, but let's, let's do it just for fun. Um,
So I want one over one over S plus one over T. All right. So I start with S and T. And I'm going to take minus one over S. And I could put a little star there, and now it's one over S. And minus one over T. So that's one over T. And then I want to add them. So I take the top right of this with the top right uh, with the top right top left of that and the bottom of this with the bottom of that and I now have this new tangle and now I want one over that which means that this comes down and this comes up and the stars get applied again because I'm doing one over and so the stars disappear And now you have to straighten that out. And when you're done straightening it out, what will it look like? It will look like a T that has been um, a rotated by uh, 90 degrees. Oh, let's see, well, how much has it got rotated by? Oh, yeah, it got rotated by 180 degrees. And you have an upside down T like that because these two are at the bottom and you pull. And so you get the upside down T and then Below it, you get an upside down S. And below that, these lines. So, so then, uh, that's the actual categorical result in the full category of tangles. The upside, the turning the triangle by, uh, by 180 degrees might not be the same tangle. It is for rational tangles, but for the calculation of the fraction, it doesn't matter. Calculating from the conductance from here to here is the same as calculating the conductance from here to here. And so the conductance of this is equal to the conductance of ST. And so we see that the, op the tangle operation or the fraction uh, uh, does obey the electrical rule. And the electrical rule is actually a consequence of the duality of this situation from this point of view. And what about that rule? Um, it also looks similar to other things uh, like, like the De Morgan law. The De Morgan law says that the negation of A and B is equal to the negation of A or the negation of B. And in this case, this is an al uh, and um, in the electrical theory, uh, the uh, you could think of negation of A is equal to one over A. And you can think of and or or as the two operations where well, this could be called s star i'll just call it star t and uh and we have s plus t so these two operations are dual to one another so it um it looks like um a kind of categorical version of logic and we've wandered all the way over to this and things about tangles starting from the rademeister moves so um that's uh part one uh, of these remarks about the notation. There's more to say here, um, but let me go on to um, let's go back to the uh, to the knot diagrams. Uh, uh, let's see. Yeah, we have enough time to talk about these things. The, um, 
The checkerboard coloring of the knot diagram to form this graph that's sitting inside it um, has lots of uh, possible forays into combinatorics that might be of use to knot theory. And, and, and since the many years, people found different things. For example, um, as you may know, uh, if you take the Alexander polynomial and you evaluate it at a minus one, um, Alexander polynomial of, of, a, of a knot K, and if K is alternating, then this is an absolute value equal to the number of maximal trees in the checkerboard graph of K. So that, that for, so for example, the truffle knot is associated with the number three, uh, it's determinant, that's the determinant of the knot, the Alexander polynomial evaluated at minus one. And the number of maximal trees in that checkerboard graph is in fact three. And three is the determinant of the Alexander polynomial. And, uh, and so certain combinatorial features of the diagram are actually equal to topological invariance of the knot. And, and some, much of this is coming about through these correspondences, which are sometimes very simple and elegant like this, and sometimes more complicated. Um, one that comes up um, implicitly in, in Alexander's original uh, work on the Alexander polynomial, which I had some fun making explicit, um, is the following relationship with the checkerboard graph and the maximal tree. Suppose you take a maximal tree in this checkerboard graph, like this one. Choose one. Sorry. I wanted to draw it carefully, so, so I'll let the edges be a little curved in order to do so. All right, there. If I do that, uh, then there is also the dual of the checkerboard graph. The checkerboard graph only occupies the shaded regions, and there are the other, the unshaded regions. and and those have a graph as well. So there's the other checkerboard graph, which is uh, living transversely to the original checkerboard graph. So this, we could call this one CB and this one CB prime. And the two graphs together will cooperate. For example, if I choose a tree in this graph, then I get dually a tree in the other graph. Uh, and if I choose both of them, and then I take the, I take an edge going through a crossing as an instruction to smooth it that way, as a smoothing instruction, why then look at what you get when you do that. Let's, uh, let's, um, let's do the smoothing. you get a single curve. The trees are now out of the way. One is inside that Jordan curve and the other is outside that Jordan curve and you get one curve. So if you start with a knot diagram and consider all the different ways that you can get one curve by smoothing its crossings, 
you are enu you are actually if you think about this you are actually enumerating the maximal trees in the checkerboard graph so in the parlance of states of the bracket which comes later historically um the single cycle states are in one-to-one -one correspondence with the maximal trees in the checkerboard graph and the single cycle the the collection of single cycle smoothings of the diagram is a nice not theorist way of talking about the set of maximal trees and the old theorem which says that there is some information in the set of maximal trees is far from wrong um the set of single cycle smoothings with appropriate labelings can be used by summing over them with the appropriate labelings can be used to produce the Alexander polynomial and also the Jones polynomial. We're used to the bracket model where we sum over all the smoothings, but in fact, with a little care, you can see that you do not need to sum over them all, but the weight, the weighting systems are a little different. You, you need um, best to sum over just the single cycle smoothings and then with one weighting you can get the Alexander and with another kind of weighting you get the Jones. And so here is, um, here is a piece of combinatorial data that's related to the knot diagram that's uh, remarkably important for calculating invariance. And in fact, these underlie the Hagard floor homology of the knot as well um, by a more complex a series of events that's related to the fact that the Hagard floor homology um, categorifies the Alexander polynomial. So, so the reach between the this um, notational way of looking at the knots and and um, and the depth of their invariance is is there, but we don't really understand what's going on here. What, it seems to me that what we're doing is knocking around and noticing patterns as we formulate and reformulate one thing and another. Um, and um, one would hope that there would be a deeper level where we would understand in a very clear way exactly what's going on. Um, now, I think that uh, I wanted to talk uh, just a little bit about the temporally v algebra because the next time I talk, I'm going to I'm going to talk about uh, ma using uh, the temporally v algebra diagrammatics to do some quantum invariance. That uh, uh, I mean to do some quantum computation models for the Jones polynomial. So let's just spend a few minutes on that uh, for the sake of the next time. Um, so this part of uh, notational things I'm sure you're familiar with, we, we can make a diagrammatic temporally Lieb algebra uh, by uh, taking this, I'll do it with uh, three strands, uh, uh, by taking this to be the identity, and then we have uh, these basic generators. And then, and then we can go on and build the rest of the multiplicative uh, algebra by adding in the ones that we didn't use and those are products. So if this is U1 and this is U2, then this is um, U1, U2, if I'm not mistaken. Let's do U1 and then U2 and that's U1, U2. And this is U2, U1 and that's a complete list up to one extra element for the temporally Lieb algebra and that's its scalar. And, and the temporally Lieb algebra was abstracted from matrix algebras that occur in statistical mechanics. In statistical mechanics, 
that would be interesting actually to show you how it comes about uh, from that point of view, but um, uh, not not in five minutes. Um, but one has uh, generators like this one, u1 through un minus one, and uh, if you take these diagrams, then you see that you have ui squared is equal to delta ui, and you have ui, ui plus one, ui is equal to ui, and ui plus one, ui, ui plus one, is equal to ui plus one, and you have ui and uj are commuting if they're far apart. And, and it was in this form that the Temperley-Lieb algebra was originally defined by Temperley and Lieb, who abstracted them from matrices that occur in the, in the matrices that describe certain statistical mechanics models. Um, but, um, but here you have a, a completely diagrammatic way of thinking about it in terms of connection structures between rows of points. And in particular, this one here as a little topological formula, because if we were to take u1 and then multiply it by u2, as we just did, and then multiply back by u1, then uh, then you see that uh, this is equivalent to this, because as far as we're concerned in the diagrammatic, we're only concerned with who is connected to whom. So these are, can be thought of as generalizations of permutation diagrams where you just are concerned with the connection of a point to a point. But here, you're allowed to connect a point to a point in the first row or a point in the second row. And the further restriction in doing temporally deep algebra is that it's planar. It's a planar algebra. You have to not cross lines with one another. An earlier algebra of a diagrammatic type is the Brouwer algebra, where you are allowed to cross lines with one another and go from top to bottom, or bottom to top, or top to top, or bottom to bottom. And Brouwer algebra was related to the representations of the orthogonal group. Temporally Lieb algebra um, has this nice presentation uh, diagrammatically. And, and so this relation looks like a bit of topology. So the the point that I wanted to uh, make, um, since we're, we're out of time, is one that Roger mentioned last week. And, um, and I think it's, uh, uh, from, from the point of view of this development of things, it looks a little surprising. That, and yet you know that this happens from algebra alone and not with any topology in it. So maybe not so surprising after all. But let me show you, show you it happening um, as it were, diagrammatically, but in a kind of, uh, uh, I mean, algebraically, but in a kind of diagrammatic way. Are we out of time? Is there a question? No. Okay. So, uh, so the other, this involves introducing another notation, but you had it last week. So let's look at it again. The notation is Dirac's. And in Dirac's notation, I can write a Ket, and I can write uh, bra. And in this case, I'm going to write a ket bra with the same label inside, like that. And this is a projector. This has the property that P applied to any other vector W is going to be equal to V multiplied by the inner product of V with W, which is a scalar. So I'll put it on the left, scalar multiplied by v. So this is a projector into the v direction, any vector at all. You have the v direction, and you have some other vector. Um, and you will be projecting that vector into the v direction and multiplying it by something. If, it, if this were, uh, if v inner product with, well, you know, you have to worry about the lengths. But it's a projector into the v direction. And what happens when you compose projectors?
So suppose that I have a P, which is a V, V, and I have a Q, which is a, a W, uh, W. Uh, now I know that P squared is equal to um, V inner product with V times P. And I know that Q squared is equal to W inner product with W times Q. So let's suppose that both V and Q have length one to make life simple. And then we have that those are, squ those are squaring to one um, in that form. Uh, but what happens to PQP? Well, then you have V and V and W and W and V. So you get a scalar times P. You get absolute V W squared, since this would be the conjugate of that, times T. So you see, and, um, and what will happen if you take QPQ? Well, then you will get the, exactly the same thing, or well, maybe it comes out the other way, WV uh, squared, but times Q. So if we were to make a, just a pure diagrammatic out of this uh, in the spirit of the previous thing, it would look like this. P is equal to um, a little uh, a little diagrammatic temporally lead element in the one-dimensional algebra, but Q is in, a, in the same one-dimensional algebra from the point of view of the ends, but it's a different one. I'll write it this way. And then we're going to have P squared is equal to a little diamond times P, and Q squared is equal to a little square times Q. That's the um, bra ket to the ket bra. And then what happens to PQP? I'm just looking at it diagrammatically. And we have this, and then we have this, and then we have this. And these guys collect up and become a scalar times P. And we have QPQ, then, uh, then it's the other way around. And these guys collect up and become a scalar. But as you see, it's the same scalar um, uh, times Q. So, so we get a temporally lead pattern in the algebra of projectors. Um, and so uh, that is both um, interesting from the point of view of the diagrammatic for the temporally lead algebra and interesting for the possible ways of making representations of the temporally lead algebra. The thing that I think is a little mysterious is that we thought uh, that one thought by looking at it from the other point of view that this remember the other point of view the other point of view was three lines three tensor lines and then a little bit of topological play allowed you to get back to the uh, to the first one here it isn't topological play it's just in a product and in fact it's geometry because if you said to yourself I'm going to have two projector uh, uh, directions. And I'm going, um, let's call this one P and this one Q. And I'm going to first project into the P direction. And I'll take some arbitrary vector. And I'm going to project it into the P direction. And then I'm going to project into the Q direction. And then I'm going to project back into the P direction then you find yourself with a multiple of having projected it directly into the P direction. So that, uh, that's what it's saying. And, and the diagrams fit with no topology, just click together and give the relation. So the relation wasn't fundamentally topological. It was perhaps fundamentally algebraic in that way. Um, and yet there's the topology in there. And they're both important uh, depending on what you're doing. And, uh, and if you want to unify it, of course, it's natural enough to unify it by thinking categorically and saying that these lines are tensor lines. And when we're using an extra line, then we're using an extra tensor product. 
and then we have more uh, interplay, uh, algebraic interplay that's possible. But it is still the case that if you take it seriously, this kind of representation of the temporally deep algebra and look at its associated algebra, then you have more leeway in making unitary representations that will work for quantum computing. And that's what I'll be talking about when I return on this topic. So um, a lot comes out of this playing around with different formulations that seem like for reformulating the notation and uh, at the same time feel like one is doing something conceptual. Um, and I don't think we quite understand what we're doing when we do all this but we shouldn't stop. I'll stop here. Oh, well, thanks a lot, um, Lou. That was, uh, that was really interesting. Um, now, uh, next week, we've got Micah, uh, Chrisman is talking on virtual not code boardism. Um, I wonder if I could swap it with you, Lou. Do you think we can I can talk? continue next week if you want? Well, I'll, I'll, I'll talk to Mika and see if he can uh, um, talk a week later. Would, Roger, would you, could you, would you email, us week, advanced, Sorry? email us advanced uh, names of the talks? Yeah, then, yeah, sure. I'll, I'll send around advanced. Yeah, we, we've sort of more or less got a program. It's sort of the. Uh, no, just a couple of days in advance would be good, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, actually, Colin, I told you last week what who, that that Lou was talking today, so you didn't. You, you didn't. didn't you did an email. I did send you an email. You didn't oh, yeah. read it. <laughs> do, do you have a place on your website where you announce this seminar? I don't have a website. Uh, oh, oh. <laughs> ah, congratulations. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Uh, Thanks a lot, Lou, and um, we'll hopefully see you all next week. Uh, but I will send round a um, uh, send round uh, what's happening next week. So okay, so I'll will stop now, um, uh, mm -hmm. and and I talk. I'm going to talk to Lou and Sam and Brian later. In one hour, right? Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay.